So I hope everyone sees my slides. Yes, some nodding heads. Um, yes, hi, my name is Thomas Schmidt from the University of Regensburg and we were already introduced. I will talk about annotating and quantifying sentiment and emotions in German place from around 1800. Um, and as you can see, we are two persons. So we separated this talk also in two parts and uh, I will deal with the first part. Um, my part will deal with what we call the past and um, which are our, our adventures in the realm of sentiment analysis in German literary texts uh, by the playwright Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. And then Catherine will continue by talking about emotion annotation and analysis in place around 1800, our current project Emotion and Drama and how we pursue um, this topic in this current project. So as I said, I will talk a lot about sentiment analysis in Lessing's place. And um, this will also really be focused just on sentiment. So the, the pure balance of text, if it's rather positive, negative, maybe mixed or neutral. And of course, there will be a lot of German appearing. Um, I try to translate it if it's necessary, but sometimes it's just for visualization purposes. So I hope that you still can follow the talk anyways. Our... Um, yeah, our adventures, as I said, with sentiment analysis are actually rooted in another project. So uh, once upon a time in the, in the distant past, the year 2018, um, we actually performed a lot of quantitative trauma analysis. So we developed a tool named Catharsis, which um, is a web tool to explore um, quantitative metrics of plays like speech statistics or character appearances and visualize these um, information uh, on a web tool. And while exploring quantitative drama analysis, we also encountered, of course, the method of sentiment analysis and we deemed it interesting to pursue. We decided to focus the sentiment analysis or more precisely our pilot study in the realm of sentiment analysis on the place of Lessing, just because we felt most comfortable with the author itself. So the corpus that um, I will talk about in the in the upcoming slides and that we explored sentiment and analysis on um, are all the plays of Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, a famous playwright of Germany. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of comedies in this corpus, a couple of tragedies. It's everything around 1750. So of course, a lot of historical language and um, the, the upcoming problems are, um, are pretty apparent. As you probably have already learned in this uh, workshop, I'm sure there are multiple methods to perform sentiment analysis. One major branch is of course to perform machine learning if you have some sort of annotated corpora that you can use. Um, another method would be um, lexicon-based methods. And I'm also sure that you heard a lot about uh, those methods. Since we didn't have any annotated material that we could use for machine learning and we also didn't uh, see much potential using contemporary corpora due to the language problems, we decided to pursue the method of lexicon-based sentiment analysis. Again, as you probably already learned, it's based on so-called sentiment lexicons, which are basically lists of words with sentiment-bearing words that are annotated concerning their polarity, their valence. So if the word is rather negative or positive, and then you can perform some very basic mathematics. You can count the positive words, the negative words, perform some very naive calculations to get an overall value of the text unit. Um, that's some basic case. And um, of course, there are some methods to optimize this approach or to perform it more sophisticated. Nevertheless, that's what we pursued. Before I talk about the concrete pipeline we developed and the concrete steps we performed to deal with a lot of the challenges. Um, I will first have to talk about the um, specific level on which we perform sentiment analysis for the evaluation and the overall analysis of place. Later on, you will see we will basically uh, perform sentiment analysis on all structural level levels from the act to the scene. But uh, the evaluation process and so on is focused on what, what is called the speech which is the utterance of a character separated by the utterance of another character. 
This can be a word, this can be a sentence, this can be, of course, multiple sentences. Um, but it's a very central unit of place, and we, of course, uh, deemed it very fitting for our first analysis. So there are multiple steps that we evaluated. You can think about it as a pipeline, so to speak, with multiple possibilities where you can choose various variants of steps. We um, evaluated five of the most popular German sentiment lexicons of contemporary language. So they are not directly optimized on our language. We explored lemmatization. Of course, many of the sentiment lexicons only consist of the base forms of words. And um, since German has a lot of inflections, lemmatization is more to speak a, a step that you have to take most of the time. We also explored the influence of filtering stop words or more precisely high frequency words. This might sound like something that's not important for sentiment analysis, but um, we actually explored this. This might be very important. And of course, we explored um, possibilities to extend our lexicon with historical variants, historical um, orthographic forms of um, words in the lexicon. I also integrated the step of including negations and valence shifters, um, and was able to also talk a little bit about that step. So, um, to explain why we chose certain steps and, and to explain the influence of certain steps, I will work my way through a couple of limitations of general limitations of sentiment based methods, of lexicon based methods, and specifically on this corpus. And I will first focus on the lexical level. So, basically, everything that can go wrong on the word level. I'm sure you already have some, some opinions of, about this or some experience about this. The most important um, lexical problem that we encountered are orthographic alternatives, orthographic variants of words in German. So these are basically words that a contemporary reader would actually understand. But if you make a very, um, very precise mapping between lexicon and text, and you go by character, character by character, you encounter problems if you, if you don't um, map these words to each other. So just a simple example, the word betrügen in German, betray in English, is just word used in a different orthographic form by um, blessing, betrügen. But of course, if you do exact matching, you wouldn't find this. We explored a bit the possibilities of spell checking, um, but weren't that successful with this approach. So what we actually found is something that not we did develop, but something else um, developed. Um, Brian Jurisch from the Deutsches Textarchiv um, developed a algorithm slash tool and also a REST API, so to speak, that you can send German words towards and you receive historical variants of these words. So orthographic forms of these words that this word had throughout the history of language. So for example, if you send Betrügen to these words, you do get a lot of historical variants and you do indeed get the word Betrügen, which is how Blessing would use it. You also get a lot of inflections, and um, so it's also some sort of lemmatization if you take it precisely. But um, in this, by this way, we extended the lexicons with historical variants, and this is of all the methods that we applied. This is the one that uh, deemed most successful. This is the one method that really changes accuracy metrics later on. But it also has a very high recall, so you, you have a couple of false positives also. It, it really enlarges the, the lexicon um, greatly. Another um, thing that we just encountered when we actually performed sentiment analysis is the problem of very high frequency words that change their val valence, so to speak, throughout the time. The prime example for this is actually uh, the word Herr, the word Herr in German, and, and you can probably translate it with something like Mr. It's, it's a form to address uh, a male person in German, but it also received quite a negative connotation in, in contemporary German. And for this reason, in contemporary lexicons, it's included as annotated negatively, oftentimes. And Lessing uses this word all the time, and it has no um, 
no valence meaning at all. It's just a word he uses to describe the interaction between his characters. And of course, if you don't filter something like this out, you, you get all, you get basically just negative predictions and that's not what you want. And this is a larger problem than you might expect at the first sight. Of course, easy to solve. You just extend stop word lists with these high frequency words by taking, I don't know, something like the top 200 words um, and then you can deal with this. Of course, there are multiple other problems on the lexical level for um, lexicon-based sentiment analysis, some of which we didn't solve in particular way. And um, it's also a bit unsure if it's solvable um, on a lexical level. Poetic words, no, neologisms, novel words invented by Lessing to, to describe something, metaphoric words. And of course, you have multiple other words that change their sentiment um, throughout the time. Um, one example here is flyer. Another example that Lessing actually uses also the word toll, which um, describes a crazy person in the past. And, and now this is a very, very positive word. And uh, we would argue that only domain specific lexicons and of course machine learning might solve some of these problems. Nevertheless, we um, have another step as already mentioned, which are negations and balance shifters. So words that occur in the surrounding of a sentiment bearing word and change the sentiment of this word. And we used a list of German negations, a list of negating prefixes and suffixes. Um, to change the value of a sentiment bearing words if these words are close to the word. We use a window of four words. Vigand and colleagues actually did some studies on German language and argued that four words is the window to use for this. And uh, yeah, that's also something we explored. Now to actually evaluate our approaches, we of course had to annotate some of um, our speeches. Um, so we had to create some sort of gold standard. Our first pilot study in, in this annotation project was um, rather naive, you might say. We basically prepared Word files for five annotators. Those annotators have received no special training. They, uh, these were just normal students, so to speak. Um, I selected semi-randomly 200 speeches, presented the speech, the predecessor speech, the speech after that, and they annotated the polarity on a differentiated level and on a binary level. And the binary level is the most interesting up for us. So is the speech, does the speech express a rather positive or a negative sentiment? And um, not super surprisingly, but for me personally at the moment, surprisingly, um, we looked at agreement statistics. So how much agree the annotators to each other? Uh, very important metric in, in sentiment analysis. And the agreement of statistics are rather low. So we get average kappa values of 0.4, which is regarded according to some interpretations, moderate agreement, but it's much lower than in other areas of sentiment analysis. So at this moment, hmm, we thought, okay, those were known non-experts. They had no clue of the historical language and so on. We actually also did some empirical work. We post the annotators a questionnaire in which they could fill out information about how they perceive the annotation. And they actually did report back that the annotation was very difficult. They were very uncertain about the annotation. It uh, was very tedious. They had difficulties with the language and the missing context. Not too surprising at that moment. Of course, they also had a lot of other problems on a much broader level. How, would they, how are they supposed to deal with irony, with sarcasm, with metaphors, with mixed expressions in one specific text unit? And of course, we identified at that moment also that literary texts probably have some sort of inherent subjectivity. They're always open to interpretation. And all this leads to very low agreement levels. Nevertheless, our argument was, um, if you get some annotators that are more motivated, more trained, we might uh, get better results. So we prepared a, another annotation study um, that we integrated in a course for German literary studies. So with students that actually had to read the plays, they talked about the plays, about emotions and sentiments in the plays. We prepared a very long and detailed annotation instruction. So what to actually annotate. Um, it was also broader in scope. Um, 
We acquired overall 1200 speeches annotated by at least two annotators. And um, yeah, furthermore, I even traveled one day to this course and um, I delivered all the students that performed the annotations some candy. So there's not much more to expect from a researcher annotator per relationship perspective that I could have done better. Nevertheless, we again um, received the same feedback and the uh, same agreement statistics, basically. So it's around 0.4, around 70% for binary polarity. Um, at that moment, we, of course, uh, realized also by the feedback of the students that the problem is more in the, in the text sort itself and in the problem that um, even if you have more context and if you more, know more of the place, you also can tend to overthink and to, and the result of our interpretation of this is that we need some sort of even more precise training and more specific annotation schemes. On a distributional level, just uh, for information purposes, we realized in this study, but also in other studies, that annotators tend to annotate mostly most speeches rather negative, which is counterintuitive in the first moment if you think about that our corpus consists of mostly comedies. But of course, if you read the comedies uh, more precisely, they are still full of tragic content, so it makes some sense. Overall, this didn't stop us to evaluate our approaches by performing majority decisions uh, and to, by, by filtering out speeches that are not, um, that are, have high disagreement. We still um, performed uh, our lexicon-based approaches as described before with all the configuration possibilities of the pipeline for all the lexicons and so on. And our best approaches um, achieve accuracies about 0.7, so 70% of the speeches are detected correctly, so to speak. Um, yeah, the best lexicons are basically lexicons that have more metric scales, so a scale from minus one to one, for example and not just the nominal scales for the positivity or negativity. The extension of historical variance is the most important method that improves accuracy, um, which says a lot about the text sort, of course. If you do also include something like negations and um, similar words, um, you don't get much better results. It's, it's fluctuating also around 70%, which is overall not that high in sentiment analysis. Um, for every example that you can find uh, where you would argue that uh, taking negation into account improves the, the result, you also find a lot of examples that prove that the result gets worse. Just a couple of examples which are actually from, from the corpus. Ich fühle nicht selbst Glück, I feel nothing by joy. If you um, change the balance of joy, you get a negative sentiment and you actually have a positive sentiment. And there are, uh, and, one thing I really learned is that the language is complex and you can find a, a lot of complex examples for stuff like this. So um, overall, we were not very satisfied with the accuracies and also the annotation um, results. It's a bit interesting because the percentage-wise um, agreement between annotators is actually um, almost the same as the accuracies we achieve. And if you look at the speeches that are falsely classified, um, you do indeed identify that the problems are the same from annotator's perspective as well as from algorithm perspective. So problems like irony, sarcasm, metaphors, very long speeches and similar things. Um, overall, we still um, also wanted to explore um, how users um, are interested in sentiment analysis. So all these results didn't stop us to develop a, a web tool to also explore our sentiment results. I will not go into detail into this tool. Um, the link is on the slides and you can, you're invited to explore it. Um, for example, here is a draft that this tool can produce to um, illustrate how in uh, a specific play, um, you can identify a tendency towards negativity throughout the five acts. And this tool produces multiple visualizations like this. We identified that users are a little, are oftentimes not cautious enough with the interpretation. They don't really keep in mind that you just have the small accuracies, you, so you have to be careful when interpreting 
um, such visualization. So we currently also um, developed a tool giving the user more power to perform their own sentiment, uh, lexicon-based sentiment analysis, send text. Um, it also produces visualization. Um, you can upload your own texts and it also offers the text and what it really happens in the text. And I think that's uh, what people are mostly interested in. They really want to see why some, some passages are more negative, more positive, and oftentimes what they identify is that um, some words are falsely interpreted by the sentiment analysis um, and further on. So this is also a tool you can explore if you are interested in this. Um, overall, this was stuff that we did um, so in the time span of 2018, 2019. We did realize that lexicon-based methods are limited in, in this context overall. We did try to explore the idea of domain-specific um, sentiment lexicons, which are still a topic. But overall, in NLP, um, I would argue that they are also considered outdated, and other methods are more the go-to methods nowadays. Um, sentiment analysis still, uh, lexicon-based sentiment analysis due to the transparency of the method still remains popular, so we still support it in some way by still supporting the tool syntax. But overall, we knew that we had to explore more modern machine learning approaches. Of course, for those approaches, we need good and valid, um, valid um, annotations. What we also uh, identified is, we also saw this in user tests, um, for the tool catharsis, I also integrated emotion calculations based on lexicon-based emotion analysis. I didn't evaluate them at all. I just integrated them for fun. Um, but it's basically the first thing that people use. They switch from polarity to emotion, and uh, they are far more interested in emotions. So obviously, that's something that literary scholars are more interested in. So this is also something we identified. We needed more and better annotation. The scheme seems not to be proper to represent the thinking of literary scholars. And we also need more precise and better training for annotators to also agree to, pro to uh, increase the agreement among these annotators. Uh, so we need annotators, student annotators that are motivated, that are in the best case paid for annotating. We need someone that deals with machine learning and has to get paid for machine learning. We need a literary scholar who is motivated by getting paid and, and by exploring all this. So overall, we identified that we need money. Um, so we asked for money and money we received, which leads us to our current project, Emotions and Drama, where we do start to explore more of the sophisticated concepts. So this is the step where I will give over to Catherine. Um, I have all the links collected to all the tools and resources that I mentioned throughout the talk on some slides. Um, so without further ado, I thank you for your attention and I hope you still have a lot of fun in the upcoming part. So, um... A warm welcome also from my side. Um, thank you for the invitation and um, thank you, Thomas, for telling the first part of our story. Here comes the second one. Um, so Thomas already mentioned our um, project Emotions in Drama. Um, it is funded by the, oh, sorry by the German Research Foundation and the project leaders are um, Professor Wolf from Media Informatics in Regensburg and myself coming from German Literary Studies and Computational Literary Studies in Würzburg. Thomas Huth is the research assistant and responsible for the, all the annotation stuff, the evaluation and the machine learning aspects. And um, the project is part of the German Research Foundation Priority Program, Computational Literary Studies. Here, literary scholars work together with computer scientists in nine projects. There's a lively exchange between the projects which um, use the same methods, for example, sentiment analysis and word embeddings, and also between projects working on the same genre 
um, for example, on drama or lyrics. It's a very productive research environment, which also helps to establish international networking and collaboration. Thomas presented the, the approaches we have taken towards sentiment analysis. And here we wanted to find out how methods like lexicon-based analysis and static, static word embeddings um, work for classifying sentiments um, on a few emotions in place of 18th century. In our follow-up project here now, um, we decided to work on a larger corpus and to investigate emotions in dra German drama from 1650 to about 1850. The basic assumption um, here is that the emotions are central to the drama of the period. To be precise, central for the dramaturgy, that is plot structure and information distribution. One may think of Aristotle's theory of catharsis as purification of suffering through representation of suffering. Um, emotions are also central for the characterization of character types, such as the Miles Gloriosus or the comic character or the two. Emotions are also central for the intended effect on the reader or the recipient. One may think of ideas of correction and or emotional movement um, in the Enlightenment, for example. And emotions are central for the propagation of anthropological ideas of um, social norms, um, anthropological idea which is central in our period of time is um, the naturalness, the natural behavior, natural express expression of emotion, um, for example. So here are our goals in this project. Um, firstly, we want to classify emotions and their evaluation or appraisal. I think this is the correct um, word. Um, to be able to see distributions over one text or over subgenres or over a time period, but also to be able to investigate if there are emotion profiles of character types of women versus men, or of bourgeois and versus nobles, and so forth. This is also part of a, a basic research in historical AE, um, because we will enlarge the possibilities or the, the knowledge of the, the, the AE. I will come back to this point um, later. So we also want to find out if there are specific sub specific emotions or emotional curves or whatever place for subgenres like drama of the Enlightenment or musical theater or sentimental comedy or classicist tragedy and so forth. And we want to find out if, if um, there is a link between emotions and their evaluation or appraisal with the intended effect. So that means if, if there are special emotions in some sort of drama, if they want it to be a drama which is a sentimental comedy. All this is to be asked for canonized drama as well as for non-canonized um, um, dramatic texts. And I'll show you uh, our corpus um, on the next slide. No, oh, and on even one later. So um, how do we define emotion? Well, basically like Oman Klinger or Klaus Fehrer, as a generic term for states of mind of characters in a drama of distinguishable quali quality at a given time. And we assume that emotions are expressed by bodily symptoms, that they may entail actions, actions or active ten tendencies, and that I, they are expressed namely through language and that they may also be praised. We use this term emotion in a meta-linguistic sense to cover all the more specific concepts of the period under research like affect, Gemütsbewegung, Rasio, or Leidenschaft uh, to, to have a covering term. In dramatic texts uh, in specific, um, we um, are interested in the, the emotion experienced um, by the characters and or attributed to them. 
attributed means that someone says that another character feels something or should feel something or asks if he feels something. Um, so that, that means that we do not, we are not interested in the emotion which should be evoked in the recipient, in the one who's reading or seeing the, the play, because this seems far too complicated uh, as a kind of uh, historical empiric empirical research without uh, people to ask. So next slide is the corpus. Um, our corpus consists of canonized as well as non-canonized works and includes on the one hand the dramas from um, texts of um, Gerhard Dracula and uh, So I'm missing one page here. Sorry. Oh, it's here. Sorry for that. <laughs> and um, we, we started now with the latest part of this canonical, canonized um, um, corpus, um, which is the, the part around 1800, because the language is not that far away from the trained models than the Baroque language, um, which we encountered in the beginning of the period. So, but in order to be able to examine non-canonized texts as well, we have done OCR, and or some text encoding for the project for the following subcorpora in these 20 Kassel plays from Vienna, um, the 20 plays from Strolling players um, around 1700 and um, about 20 to 30 opera libretti of the Hamburg opera of the same period because around 1700 we have a, a, a huge gap in the, in the canon of German plays. So we want to quantify emotions, and these are the steps we take to achieve this goal. So um, we um, first have to annotate um, a training and evaluation corpus, and um, yeah, in the beginning stands the def development of emotion annotation schemes. Then. Um, we will have to do the annotation of plays from three different eras with emotion and source target information, polarity and negation information. Um, this leads to emotion annotated training corpora, which can will be used to train uh, artificial intelligence. Um, for this, um, so we have to train, uh, adapt word embeddings and uh, specifically word um, to historical and poetic language of different, of those different eras with eras, I mean, um, periods of about um, 50 years in which we separated our huge um, period on the investigation. Then we will train um, uh, emotion prediction and see um, what comes out and um, we'll do that also with non-annotated text. This will be a very um, uh, interesting uh, and very interesting point of the uh, research project. And of course, we will then um, try to on answer all the questions I mentioned uh, under goals about um, characters and subgenres and literary history. So what is an appropriate set of emotions for this sake? So let's, um, if one looks at the basic emotions in psychology, one can see that they are not all relevant for our domain. Blue chick system, for example, names fear, danger, joy, sadness, disgust, which we also, also choose, but also some others which we do not use because they are not specific to our domain as, for example, trust, anticipation, or surprise. They may appear, but we had to re reduce ourselves, as you will see in, in, a, in a few seconds. Um, um, the next problem is that in the long period we chose, um, we have uh, several historical concepts of emotions, too many and um, different emotions and too many different concepts 
are a, a real problem at this point. Um, I just named you all the 15 in effect, affected which scholastics in, in Baroque um, yeah, had in had in mind um, and which we can easily find in, in the dramatic text of Crucius or Lohenstein, of course. And the third point we had to take in mind was that those concepts of emotion um, should also fit for training uh, of neural networks, so which is a, a, a real research question. The only thing we know is that we need um, distinguishable cases, um, but we don't know really um, what uh, where the limits are. So we'll find out that. Um, so the challenge was to find a set of emotions that are fundamental to play, as well as appropriate for the entire period. And, and from the point of view of literary su studies, um, the set um, presented on the next slide is of course unsatisfactory because it's not differentiated enough. But we um, have, um, may um, answer to this question that on the one hand side, we are just beginning with that kind of research. And on the other hand side, this is primarily basic research um, for a big part. So when we have satisfying hit rates at the end, we may retrain the classifiers on more emotions on different concepts of love, for example, on metaphorical language use, etc. So here's our set of emotions. Um, at the moment, we annotate 10 emotions, some emotion subcategories on the left side, plus disgust, which you can find at the end of the list. We also added at the end of the list um, emotional movement or agitation to distinguish important to to to, to annotate important passages of the dramatic text in which characters are simply very emotionally agitated but do not know or name the emotion, or in which they vacillate between emotions in a sentence or replica. So in some drama, this is very is a very common phenomenon. The upper categories of affection, joy, fear, and suffering are a kind of exit strategy for the machine learning. In other words, if it turns out that the subcategories are not well assigned in prediction, we can combine um, the annotated cases into the supercategories and try the training with the simpler um, supercategory. So desire, love, and friendship will not be distinguished or not trained separately, but together as emotions of effect, affection. In our set, you also see plus and minus signs. Um, they show the default polarity. Joy, for example, is positive. Suffering is negative. Love is positive. If nothing special is annotated, this polarity is attributed automatically when we annotate an um, um, emotion. But because love may also be sorrowful, suffering also desired and positive, um, we have provided the possibility to annotate deviating polarities, as we name it. Yesterday, they, you have already worked thoroughly on these polarities. Therefore, now only one interesting example, schadenfreude. Um, it's hard to, to translate. It's sometimes it's black, black humor, but in English, it's also schadenfreude. We have in our set as a positive emotion because the character who is happy about the damage of someone else has a positive emotion for him. You know? But if someone, as in this case here on the right hand uh, side on the slide, attributes Schadenfreude to another character and therefore depreciates him, Schadenfreude is to be annotated with a negative polarity. In the example here, Telheim, the character Telheim, chose the servant just because of his treacherous father. We also um, distinguish source and target, or to be precise, utterance instance, 
which may be either char a character or the implicit author, source and target. For source, we distinguish between the experiencer who feels the emotion and an attributing instance, um, which may be there, but is not necessary, of course. All these instances can be um, indicated in a, in a sentence or not. Um, of course, the speaker or the utterance instance is always there in a dramatic text. This is a very comfortable thing about dramatic text um, compared to prose fiction, for example. In the example of the last slide, we had to tell him as attributing instance who attributed Schadenfreude to Just as an experiencer. Here we have the experience here, Just, who is also the utterance instance who would love to beat um, a landlord on his back. This is the um, translation of the Wenn ich ihm doch eins auf den Katzenbuckel geben dürfte. And the landlord is the target of his anger. Here we have some more examples. Um, in, uh, the first example is, um, uh, is, is love, which um, a mother expresses towards her son. Um, she is the source of this um, uh, emotion. She's the experience of the target is her son, Wilhelm. So we underline this here. Um, in the next example, we have emotional movement. Um, this is um, the source of this is an attributing instance, um, the implicit author, because it's not a character speaking here. The character who's um, then speaking is named Unbekannter, unknown, and uh, he, in this case, is the target of the um, emotional movement. Then um, another example, the next uh, sentence, Nein, länger halte ich nicht aus, I can stand it anymore. Um, uh, expresses um, suffering. Um, the experiencer is the character Unbekannter and the target is here an event. So I think this gives an Im impression of what we, we do here. So um, develop, it took a while to develop uh, our scheme. When we started at first, the theme grew constantly. Um, it um, got more and more um, emotions. And we also had metaphors and other tropes and emotional cues and so forth. And then uh, it took all very long to annotate a text. And um, then it became um, slightly slimmer again. And um, for five months now, it has been stable. Still, uh, we have some drama that needs to be um, annotated in you now because uh, it follows older annotation schemes. However, we learned that this is a normal process and annotation project. So um, keep in mind to schedule this time in your project or PhD work. For doing the annotation, we used the um, Katma tool, which is free, a freely available web tool where you can um, um, define your tag sets, which you can see here on the right hand side yourself. Um, it has some difficulties um, uh, with the output format. Um, um, it's, it's a bit tricky, but uh, well, we, we Thomas finally managed to, to cope with it. So our annotation workflow is uh, two student assistants annotate independently of each other. And um, then we have a subsequent consensus annotation in the presence of the literary project management, which is the decision-making authority. That sounds amazing in English, but uh, in fact, it's just me, this authority, um, having a good knowledge on that subject um, um, because I um, did some research uh, on it um, for a few years. Um, but it's a bit, um, yeah, we wanted to have it a bit like uh, the normal work of a literary, um, yeah, literary studies person, because we uh, we usually discuss things in in seminars, or we read other research and then build on it. And so this seemed to be a better process than three different um, independent um, annotations. So this is just uh, the picture for it. 
so our annotation state uh, at the moment is that we have um, these um, um, players you can see here, um, and we have um, two up to three um, and, uh, um, annotations. And um, soon, in a few weeks, we will start to do the first training with this training corpus. So our project is at work for in, in April, 1st of April last year we started. So what we want to do then, um, you, you, I think, think you're familiar with the um, with machine learning. It's just um, um, the idea to train a model which, which gets some samples first and uh, attributes features to them. Then um, we correct the output of the model, which here is a neural network. And so the model learns something, gets better in prediction. Um, the idea is that it then gives them its new data and it, uh, it's also good in prediction or you correct this prediction, this, these results again and do the process um, from the beginning. We have several baselines. Um, um, you can, as you can see here, um, the annotator agreement, lexicon based approaches, classical machine learning with all those algorithms, bag of words, knife base, SVM, etc. And um, what they all have in common, I think you've worked that too um, in the last days, is that the, they attribute one value to each word. It's just one value. So in the entire corpus, cued or um, between or whatever has one value. They are static. So what we want to do now, we want to go beyond this with the, the dynamic word embeddings. Um, here, the value of each word changes according to the environment it, in which it is, it is placed. Um, that means if you have um, the same word in uh, different sentences, it will have a different value in this sentence. Um, there's a word embedding trained already for German text on the German Wikipedia. It's called bird case German case. Um, um, you see the link on the slide. Um, uh, and here words are represented as vectors and words that have the same meaning have the same vector and words with a similar meaning or with similar relations are closer to each other. So the, this is a mathematical mathematical expression of semantic relations um, and not just a statistical representation um, what is more like the static word embeddings. So this gives, um, it's a very mighty model, it's used a lot, there are many lot of people developing it and um, um, we are happy to, uh, to, to be able to um, contribute a bit to this historical uh, artificial intelligence um, training. So this is my last slide. Um, um, nevertheless, this word embedding has still to be improved. Um, we have these, this pre-trained large word embedding. This is the um, uh, German word uh, case one I, I mentioned on the last slide. Um, but we have to train that on historical text because of the language. Thomas showed you um, very um, vividly what, um, what the problems are. Um, and um, this gives another other, uh, um, problem because we have also to train it on plays of that period or on fictional text. What you see on the on bottom of the slide is a, a literary German word with it, which is trained on prose fiction of several um, centuries. So um, this comes already near and we can start with that and um, train it with data from 18th century then for plays. And then we can give it our emotion annotated corpora and train the, um, it to predict our emotion and uh, um, the emotions we are interested in. And this is the last um, point on the slide is the prediction and um, we hope that we that we'll manage it. So 
more information you can um, you can find on, on these slides um, um, and um, our contact information is also here and um, we have put some references but they are not uh, really publications at that point yet of our project we have just here those um, the poster slam video for the digital humanities day but i think you are the best informed um, persons about our project at the moment. Thank you very much, and I'm interested in your questions. Thank you very.